trying to develop MDMA for medicine for post-traumatic stress disorder. But I think it's important to understand the big picture first, and that's what I'll start with. Um, and I'm also, uh, you'll notice I called this uh, semi-synthetic MDMA. So I'd like to say that uh, people are part of nature, and what is created in the lab can be just as therapeutic as what comes from plants including LSD and MDMA and other things. So I think that that, that also was Sasha Shulgin's perspective as well. So why does it uh, matter? Um, Einstein said it has become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. We just look around with global warming and nuclear weapons and that's uh, obvious. Um, the UNESCO Charter created after World War II had a clue. Since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. So this is leading us towards thinking about psychological solutions to um, world hatred and, and strife. Einstein gave another clue. The splitting of the atom has changed everything save our mode of thinking, and thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. What we shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if mankind is to survive. And what is that new manner of thinking? That's, I think, uh, mysticism and the sense of connection. And it's the dissolving of the us and them uh, dichotomies. And Edgar Mitchell can confirm this in a sense. Uh, when we see our fundamental unity with the processes of nature and the functioning of the universe, as I so vividly saw it from the Apollo spacecraft, the old ways of thinking and behaving will disappear. And for me, the ultimate confirmation really came from Robert Mueller, who was the Assistant Secretary General, the mystic at the UN, uh, the United Nations University for Peace in Costa Rica was one of the things he started. And he wrote this book in about 82, New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality. And his thesis was, we have the United Nations to mediate disputes between countries, but a lot of those disputes are really religious in nature. And we need people from different religions to stop hating and killing each other. And somehow we need this uh, global spirituality. And for me, that I think is really the deepest motivation for the work that I do. I think that we have uh, important evolutionary developments of our species that will come from realizing that we don't need to be scared of people that are different from us. And we don't need to feel threatened by other ideologies. But how do we do that? It really it's not so easy to just think that thought. If you can experience it in a deep way, then that will really lead more towards behavior change. So I wrote to Robert Mueller, he wrote me back, and we developed a relationship. And the book doesn't mention psychedelics, but he said that psychedelics really were important. And then he referred me to a bunch of different people to whom I sent psychedelics. <laughs> um, mystics and rabbis and monks and things like that. And they wrote back to him. So for me, I think this really is um, where we're going, where we need to go, where we're seeing a lot of things are happening with this emergence of global spirituality. And for a lot of us, it doesn't really happen from our religions of origin. Uh, my bar mitzvah did not turn me into a mystic. <laughs> um, it, it did uh, increase my bank account, which was good. <laughs> but beyond that, um, it didn't do much. 
And so I think for many of us, psychedelics are the royal road to these kind of experiences. The way um, you know, Freud talked about dreams as the royal road to the unconscious. So I think that for the kind of social change we see, we see now that Trump and others are motivating people on the basis of fear and fear of the other. And so you can say, oh, he's the problem. But he's not the problem. The problem is millions and millions of people are voting for him that are motivated by fear. So we have to kind of ground this spirituality in tens of millions of people or more, and then we'll be immune from those kind of manipulations. So this experimental work that was done, that Ralph was involved in, that uh, Tim Leary, Ram Dass, uh, Walter Pankey was involved in 1962, the Good Friday Experiment. Um, I'm not going to go into it for reasons of time, but basically it was divinity students in church on Good Friday, half got, a, they all got a pill, half was psilocybin, half was placebo, and those nine out of the 20 had a full or partial mystical experience, eight out of the nine had the psilocybin. Um, Walter Pankey, who did the study, died in a scuba diving accident in 1971, and so I'm convinced that he would have done a long-term follow-up, because the thing that's really important about mystical experiences is not what you describe, but what is the impact on your life? And you can't really tell that in the short run. You need to see what happens over time. So I, I tracked these people down after 25 years, and they confirmed for me that it was a genuine mystical experience, and they said this during the uh, Nancy Reagan uh, just say no period. And when they would have had motivation to disavow it, but they affirmed it, and they said that it increased their tolerance of other religions, it deepened their equanimity in the face of difficult life crises, it promoted greater solidarity and identification with foreign peoples, minorities, women, and men in nature, I mean, they're all men, and reduced their fear of death. And they attributed their actions in various social change movements to having been further inspired by their mystical experience. So all of that is sort of the theory of social change and why I think we need to really integrate psychedelics into our culture and into the the world's culture. Now, how do we do it? We have here in Santa Fe, the Unión de Vegetal, um, the Native American Church. It's possible for religious freedom, but religious freedom is very constrained, and uh, it's also religion. <laughs> so you have to buy into certain things. The, the religions can be beautiful, but at the same time, they don't really promote individual spirituality, and it's hard to see them really expanding. Although we see the incredible evolution of um, or the spread of ayahuasca, as Dennis was talking about, throughout Western culture. And it's largely taking place without police harassment. And I think that's because we do have some religious freedom examples, and the, the police aren't really wanting the bad publicity of busting people who are obviously not selling large amounts, using things for you know, personal growth, and people who are well-connected. So religious freedom is one way, but I think it's... it's important, but I think medicine and science is more likely to make it into our culture and to really make it happen. So this is a slide that talks about, um, for the last 45 years, the attitudes of the American public, the voters, towards the legalization of marijuana. So if we look here, right here, this is 1970, this is against, this is for, there's this rise here in the 70s, this is the Carter era. And you know, for those of us who lived through it, we all were convinced that marijuana is gonna be legal right around the corner. And obviously we were way, way wrong. And there was this backlash, this massive backlash from the parents' groups worried about their kids. And then things stay, stayed stable for about 20 years. And attitudes started moving up around 1996. Across there. Now, right now, just the, the most recent poll shows 61% of voters are in favor of legalizing marijuana. So what actually happened here to change people's attitudes? 1996 was when California and Arizona legalized medical marijuana. And exit polls that are done of people who are voting on marijuana legalization shows that the most important factor towards whether somebody's in favor of legalization is not if they smoke pot themselves. You would think that pot smokers don't want to be criminals, but it's if you know a medical marijuana patient. So medicalization and the models of distribution that are not linked to violence changes people's attitudes about legalization. And I think that's what we're going to see with the medicalization of psychedelics. And that's what will get us to opportunities for large numbers of people in population to legally access these substances. So now what I'm going to do is briefly review what's taken us 30 years to produce evidence about the therapeutic use of MDMA, 
MAPS has spent since its origins around $26 million. Um, about a, a third of it is directly on the MDMA PTSD studies. So this is kind of an expensive uh, series of slides. And <laughs> what, what I want to also acknowledge, uh, Ralph and uh, the conference that Dennis talked about in 2000, the ayahuasca conference at C the CIS ayahuasca conference in San Francisco, because it was there that I met Michael Minover for the first time, the psychiatrist that is leading our work with MDMA. And he approached me then and he said, let's um, set up a psychedelic clinic somewhere offshore where we can treat people. He had just had a patient, had Ibogaine at, in St. Kitts. And I said, no, let's not do that. It's time for us to try to make change from the inside out and let's see if we can get permission in the US instead of going to some peripheral place. And he agreed to that challenge. It took us four years and eventually we were able to start the first study. Since then, we have completed um, studies in the United States, Israel, Canada, and Switzerland. We've treated over 105 people, and we are now gathering our data to submit to FDA for what's called an end of phase two meeting. And the phase two studies are just pilot studies where you try to figure out what's your method, who's your patient population, what are your outcome measures, you know, how do you um, refine what you're doing in terms of the treatments, how do you even conduct these studies. And then the phase three studies are what counts to make a drug into a medicine. And so we're on that transition, Hefter is on that transition for the psilocybin for end of life. And so this is, um, what you're gonna get in a way is a preview of the package that we're preparing for the FDA that we're gonna be submitting to them in early May or end of, of April. First thing is you have to have medical grade MDMA. We have MDMA that we're using that was made by Dave Nichols at Purdue University in 1985. Um, I paid him uh, $4,000 for a kilogram of MDMA. Um, Dave was a terrific uh, synthetic chemist. He got a yield more than he anticipated, around a kilogram and a half. So we now still have 960 grams of MDMA left. It's 31 years old, and it's still among the best MDMA purity in the world. And the FDA is still permitting us to use it. But Dave used some aluminum foil in the process for which he doesn't have the origins of where this aluminum foil came from. And so it doesn't count as medical grade MDMA. So we cannot use it in phase three. Now we're getting one kilogram of MDMA, phase three, $400,000 is what it's costing us. Um, and, but we're going to a major pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, company and um, Chesson in the United Kingdom, they're also making the psilocybin for Hefter, and uh, I just wanted to make sure that if we succeeded, they could handle it, so uh, this is their facility. <laughs> this will eventually be producing MDMA for the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, then the next thing is safety. So we've heard a lot about MDMA neurotoxicity and what it does for serotonin uh, nerve terminals, and the fundamental question is, are there functional consequences? First off, does it even happen at therapeutic doses? And secondly, if it does, does it even matter? And the evidence has narrowed down to it barely matters, but if it does, it's for memory issues, neurocognitive consequences. So we've done a series of neurocognitive tests with people before and after two or three MDMA sessions. So we're not trying to say this is safe for people to take a thousand times at parties or a hundred times at parties, but is it sufficiently safe in a clinical setting used therapeutically? And so what we're able to show here is that um, the placebo, the comparator, this is um, 25, 30, or 40 milligrams, this is 100, this is uh, 125, this is before MDMA, this is after. There's, there's no difference, there's no effect. So we're able to show that there's no concerns about MDMA neurotoxicity in terms of neurocognitive performance, and we're hoping that the FDA will make it so we don't even have to do these tests when we scale up. And there's other tests that have been done with ecstasy users that confirm and suggest this is really right. Now, we know that sometimes people are um, at raves, overheat and die, and so MDMA can cause hyperthermia, so we monitor people's temperature, and this is just to show that the temperature barely goes up, but it does go up. It goes back down to almost normal. People's temperature normally rises in the course of a day. We start the MDMA at 10 in the morning and end the session at 6 p.m. with a male-female co-therapist team. 
So this is the um, range. Ooh, sorry. This is the range of temperatures. So we've never had a problem with temperature. Nobody's in need of treatment. So temperature is not an issue for MDMA used in a clinical setting. It's when take, people take MDMA, dance all night, overheat, don't have adequate fluid replacement, then it could be a problem, but not in a clinical setting. The other issue is blood pressure. MDMA increases blood pressure. Um, we do screen out people with heart problems. Um, however, if people have hypertension and it's controlled, we give them a stress test and then we'll let them into the study. So controlled hypertension is fine. This is just to show the systolic blood pressure and the range. This is the diastolic and the range. We've never had to do any interventions at all. And the FDA has now said that we don't even, we have to still monitor blood pressure, but we don't have to watch it. We actually have it all covered up with the um, cover so that, because that's one way to break the blind is watching about people's blood pressure. So we don't even have to look at it unless there's an issue, then we look at it. We haven't had to do that. So um, the other issue is what kind of um, side effects do people experience? And we talk about it uh, every day for a week after the MDMA sessions. We gather this, but we gather it through the three and a half months of the study and then also two months afterwards. But the most important acute ones are jaw clenching, anxiety, decreased appetite. The circle there is showing that the MDMA people are, have it more than the um, placebo group. and then. Headache and fatigue actually come are more in the placebo group. So it shows you the value of having a placebo group. Um, and then muscle tension, nausea, feeling cold, are more in the MDMA group, but then it dissipates. So there's really no significant, we haven't seen anybody commit suicide, we haven't had any psychotic breaks. We have a very supportive context where people are sort of kept in a very close uh, communication with the therapists. And sometimes people do want more therapy, they do want extra sessions. It's difficult to integrate stuff, but, but we haven't seen any kind of significant uh, drug-related serious adverse events. So from a safety point of view, we're in pretty good. So now, from an efficacy point of view, this is sort of the big picture. This is the you know, $7 million slide right here. This just really shows the people at the baseline and then the 12-month follow-up. Now, I'm gonna have to explain a little bit more is that um, we have, the way our basic study is done is we have a control group and we have the MDMA group. The control group, after we get their primary outcome measures, which I'll show you in the next slide, they get what's called a crossover. So the control people can actually get full dose MDMA in what's called open label. Everybody knows they're getting MDMA. So what this slide is, is everybody in our studies, except for one or two people, didn't want to go from the placebo to the MDMA. But these are all MDMA people. We're still gathering some of the 12-month long-term follow-up. So we have 107 people at the beginning, only 64 there at the end. But the black horizontal line is moderate to severe PTSD. That's what you have to have to be in the study. And so on average, we're doing remarkable in terms of helping people overcome their PTSD. So this is way... Um, better than Zoloft to Paxil, the SSRIs that are approved by FDA for PTSD. Now, this is the more complicated slide. So the middle point is the blinded portion after everybody has gotten two MDMA sessions or two placebo sessions. And so this is the spread here that we have to uh, demonstrate to the FDA it has to be statistically significant. And the thing that makes it even harder for us to show this spread is that the placebo is not really placebo. The placebo is therapy, 40 hours of therapy with a male-female team that's often quite effective. That's what this shows is we got a significant decline here in the placebo group and we have to do better when we add the MDMA, which we do. And then this group then gets the MDMA and there they are. So this is the, the summary of studies in multiple different countries, multiple different co-therapist teams. The other issue is what if, um, we have just exceptionally talented co-therapy teams, just a few of them, and then how do you roll it out to hundreds or thousands of therapists? So we've at least tried to use um, different co-therapy teams, different sites, and we've probably got about nine different male-female co-therapy teams working on the numbers that, that you see here. And this is, um, to sh this is where the blinded portion, this just to show you is that, um, the decision here is this is after two sessions, this is after three sessions. So this is a, um, about a three or four million dollar decision. 
do we give people two sessions or do we give people three sessions? And what this shows is that while the gap doesn't really change that much between two and three, there are continued improvement. And so some people won't really get over their PTSD after two sessions. So what we've decided to do is to try to really maximize outcomes and add three sessions. So our phase three model is going to be here. And this just shows that there's continued declines in both groups, but we still have a big enough spread to get approval. Now, one of the things that has been learned from the psilocybin work and from the early LSD work is that the results of working with end of life with psilocybin or LSD, that the mystical experience is correlated with therapeutic outcome. The deeper the mystical experience, the better people get in terms of reducing their fear of death or overcoming alcoholism or heroin addiction or nicotine addiction. So we're using the same exact measure with MDMA. And what this shows is that people do have, um, these are the active doses, a 0.6 is a full mystical experience. The mean is 0.46. So people do get pretty mystical experiences on, on MDMA. Uh, the, these are the low-dose comparator doses, not much in the way of mystical experiences. But then, when we look at it this way, there's no correlation between the mystical experience and reduction of PTSD symptoms. This is the fundamental difference between the work with psilocybin and the work with MDMA. And this has led us to all sorts of discussions about memory reconsolidation, fear extinction, and the more you're grounded in your biography while you're feeling safe, talking a trauma, the more the memory is stored in such a way that the next time you recall it, you're recalling the trauma, traumatic incident, but from a feeling of safety. So this is the key. so that's why our therapy method is even different as well. Um, now we've learned that MDMA is safe. The efficacy is medium to large. The cause of the PTSD is irrelevant to the treatment. It can be war related. We worked with veterans, firefighters, police officers, women survivors of um, sexual abuse and childhood abuse. And that the double blind doesn't work. Not that surprising to find. But when you compare MDMA versus inactive placebo, the double blind doesn't work. And what we didn't expect is that low doses that do introduce a certain amount of confusion between did they get the low dose or the high dose have an anti therapeutic effect. People are stimulated, but the fear is not reduced. And we have more dropouts. People don't really like the low doses. Occasionally, somebody will, it'll cross a threshold and it'll be therapeutic, but, but on average, the low doses aren't so good. So this is what's gonna be our phase three design. It's gonna compare three MDMA sessions. The first one was 75 milligram, then the option to go from 75 to 125, and then the same as the third to go up or stay the same, and then a two month follow-up, and then we'll compare the group that gets the MDMA with the group that gets the placebo. And the key part, according to the FDA, is that when your double blind fails, you need independent raters, and we have a whole complicated system for how we're going to randomize the independent raters so that they don't know, is this somebody's baseline, is this their final outcome? So this is the proposal that's going to go to FDA. It's going to cost, we estimate, around $22 million. This is why we're so focused on marketing. <laughs> and, um, but we already have about half of it. So um, about 5.3 million came from Roshana Haley. I'd like to encourage all of you to um, use Dr. Bronner's soaps. Uh, David is on our board of directors and he's pledged a million dollars a year starting next year for five years. And I said, well, why don't you give us a million dollars this year? And he said, well, this year I want to help legalize marijuana. <laughs> so <laughs> he's going to help legalize pot in California and elsewhere. And then we have a, a million dollar pledge, anonymous, which uh, hopefully one day they'll not feel the need to be anonymous. So we've got a lot of money to raise, but we believe we can do it. We don't need it all at one time. And we're going to sort of have a reality check over the next uh, six months or so with FDA. And we hope to start phase three uh, beginning in 2017. Now, we also have other things that we're looking at. Uh, one is MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for social anxiety in adults on the autism spectrum. I'll just show you these are our results. This is from only eight people. It's a 12-person study but obviously it's really working great. And even people who are autistic can learn about emotions, body language, reading other people's, communicating, looking at people in the eye. We're having remarkable people that have never had a date, so it's, it's another area. <laughs> um, and then we're also doing work with end of life, um, with MDMA, uh, with um, Phil Wolfson. 
Um, this is uh, 18 subject study. This is also a uh, small pilot study. Um, there was just a front page article in the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, and one of the subjects said, I had a vision of my adult courageous self without a molecule of fear, finding this cowering, shivering little child, another version of myself, and taking him under his wing and saying, everything is going to be okay. That's sort of the essence of the MDMA experience. So I think that uh, MDMA can be a terrific drug for people who are anxious about dying. But I would say that the work with psilocybin for end of life is also crucially important, and it does different things. So it's not like MDMA is better than psilocybin, psilocybin is better than MDMA. What we're trying to do is legitimize the field of psychedelic psychotherapy. And people will get a sequence of different psychedelics during a course of treatment. And I would imagine they might start with MDMA and then go to a more classic psychedelic and then maybe end up with MDMA. But it's more about psychedelics in combination based on what the patients and the doctors um, think is best at the moment. Now, we're also uh, going to tell you about a major breakthrough. Uh, you can only make drugs into medicines for diseases, but one of the best uses, I can be done in two minutes, one of the best uses of MDMA is couples therapy, or couples, romances. I mean, that's why it's so popular. You're a better listener, you're more empathic. Um, so it turns out that we're working with the Veterans Administration, and they're willing to work with us uh, informally. We have to fund the first study, but um, we're collaborating with a VA trained therapist who's developed what's called cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. And it's in dyads where one member has PTSD, and, but it affects the couple. And so the big breakthrough is that we've got permission from FDA, DEA, IRB to give MDMA to both members of the couple. It's the first time since Rick Strassman started psychedelic research in 1990 that more than one person is going to get a psychedelic drug at a time. And eventually, you know, as we know with a lot of group uh, religious ceremonies, you know, we, we'd like to see how group therapy works, but that's going to take a while to get there. Candace Monson is the woman that's going to do it. Um, and we're doing something with Mara. So now plants, finally. Um, <laughs> There's a, a political obstruction of medical marijuana research, and so I felt like that's something we need to focus on to eliminate. And um, there's a government monopoly on the supply of marijuana, so we figured, okay, we're gonna try to study marijuana for PTSD. A lot of people use it. It's really helpful. It doesn't solve the problem. It's palliative. People don't have nightmares. It took us over six years. Um, we were featured on Sanjay Gupta. Uh, Weed 3 was about it. And what we're doing is we're comparing 12% THC with virtually no CBD, um, virtually no THC with 12% CBD, a combination, and then a placebo. And these are 76 U.S. veterans. And half the study is going to be at Johns Hopkins, and the other half is going to be in Phoenix, Arizona. And we're still waiting on DEA approval. I was working this morning with Senator uh, Gillibrand's staff and others, our DEA consultant, about how to pressure the DEA to get moving. We're just waiting on them. And this is, a, we're still protesting to try to um, get our own farm at UMass Amherst. Uh, it turns out since 1970, we're the only ones to have ever asked to break the government monopoly on marijuana. And that's also because they've tangled us up in laws, lawsuits and for 15 years and we've spent a lot of money. But now we're um, working with Covington Burley, a big DC law firm that uh, Attorney General Holder works for, former Attorney General. So we, we think we maybe can persuade Obama before he leaves office to give us a license. And then to sort of pave the way to a post-prohibition world, we have the Zendo Project, which is, um, it used to be that it was about the political um, dynamics of people who did psychedelics challenging the status quo in the 60s, that caused the backlash. Now it's about parents worried about their kids and at festivals. So we're creating models at festivals all over the world of people who are um, with difficult trips, but we bring therapists, psychiatrists, and social workers and other people that are talented in this area, and they, we help people work through difficult experiences. And we do it um, as, as sort of a model to show. We do it Burning Man, Lightning in a Bottle, Africa Burn, Envision Costa Rica, and we even have our own flag. Makes me feel like you know, we've got our own country. Um, that Burning Man that gave it to us. And um, to show you that progress is possible, we took Burning Man to the Washington, D.C. Mall. This was in November. Uh, this is the first time in over a hundred years that there's been an open fire on the uh, Washington DC mall. Not only that, but we had an uh, all-night party with DJs. Now, you can't have a party on the Washington mall. You have to protest something. You have to be upset about something. So we protested the drug war, and we said we needed to 
cathartically dance away the drug war all night. And uh, my favorite moment of this whole um, event was at 4.30 in the morning, um, David Bronner and I were dancing, and the DJ, now keep in mind, we're right between the White House and the Washington Monument, and the music was super loud. And the DJ put on um, Jimi Hendrix, American Anthem from Woodstock. And I felt like after all these years, here we were with a permit, the police were guarding us, they weren't trying to arrest us, and uh, we were able to sort of dance to the Woodstock and sort of have made it. So hopefully the idea is the Woodstock generation, you know, becoming mainstreamed. And we've got a permit for next year too. Um, and the temple was actually burned into, down to a jail cell, and then the jail cell burned up too. That was, it was fantastic, it was so inspiring, this experience. And what we're doing is, this is our 30th anniversary, I have 30 more seconds, this is our 30th anniversary, and so we've looked at other movements, like gay rights, gay marriage, and how do they work? And they work because people came out of the closet, and people thought, oh, okay, you know, gays are terrible people, and then somebody says, no, I'm gay, and you like what I've done, and why do you hate me? So the, the coming out process really matters. So we're having a series of um, dinners. We're asking people to host psychedelic dinners where they invite their friends and they just tell stories of what psychedelics have meant to them in their lives or what they hope for psychedelic research and then at the end if they want to they can donate to buy legal MDMA. So this is to help people have a legal, uh, participate in a legal drug deal and help with the coming out. And we have people in over 20 countries are doing this now. So this is our month of our 20th, 30th anniversary in April. And then the last thing is just to, uh, well, I missed this word. Oh, there we go, psychedelic science. So we're gonna have another big psychedelic science conference in 2017. So I think we're really moving pretty strongly into integrating psychedelics into our culture. And I think the pioneers uh, of what Dennis and Terrence have done to, to lay the groundwork and Ralph and uh, Tim Leary and Ram Dass and all, it's, it's just, the, it took a long time. But actually when you think about it, what's 50 years? I mean, it's, it's a heartbeat. So it's not really that long, and it's necessary. So that's where we're going. Thank, thank you very much.